Hey everyone, welcome back to another video. Before we kick things off, I just want to make a quick word. If you'd like to get in touch with Ken Hooks or I, I'll include our contact information in the description box below. Ken comes highly recommended. He's a registered respiratory therapist and a registered polysomnographic technologist. As a patient with sleep disorder breathing himself, Ken has a deep understanding of this condition and he recognizes the gap between conventional medicine and what's really needed for effective treatment. Ken is also able to send a level three home sleep test anywhere in the US or Canada and his expertise in troubleshooting PAP therapy is pretty much unmatched. I also just completed a sleep course, which I can't recommend enough for anyone considering a career in sleep medicine or preparing for the RPSGT exam. Lastly, 53% of you who watch my videos are still not subscribed. So let me take a moment to ask a favor of you guys. If you wish to support the movement and help this channel grow, please consider subscribing and liking this video. This engagement helps ensure that this content reaches others who could benefit from it as well. All right, let's get on to the video. All right, so this patient has HIRDI 3.6, uh, which does not qualify him for sleep apnea, being that you have to have HI of uh, uh, 5.0. Um, one thing that I wrote in here was that prevalence of upper air resistance is notably greater than apnea hypopnea. And so this patient, though they don't qualify as having sleep apnea, still has signs and symptoms of sleep apnea. Um, they would be turned away. They would be given stimulants if they're tired during the day. Uh, something to sleep if they have insomnia. Uh, one thing that I look at on this report is the fact that the deep sleep is lower than normal. 13% to 20% is around the normal uh, range for an adult. I like to see around 17%. Uh, the body won't go into deep sleep unless it feels safe. You can't uh, hear or feel anything during deep sleep, so the body won't allow you to go there. Um, REM sleep is about 20% to 25%. He got 18%, so he's low there too. If we take a look at his hypnogram, we'll see that there's a decent amount of fragmentation um, throughout this sleep study. All this whenever, fragmentation. Whenever the bars go to the top, he's awake, basically, right? Yes, that's right. Uh, the line at the top is wake. Uh, the salmon or pink is REM sleep. Light sleep, which is one or two, is blue. And then deep sleep is green. So anytime that we see these uh, ones that go all the way to the top, those are periods of being awake. Um, so there's a lot of fragmentation here. There's a lot of breakdown of the sleep stages. And then the other thing uh, that I wanna show is this pulse rate. So on a hypnogram, I'll usually go straight to this pulse rate because the pulse is the most important thing to me. The heart will take the brunt of the trouble. So anytime that we see the pulse thick like this, that means there's a lot of fluctuations, a lot of up and downs throughout there. Uh, the second half of the study, you can see there's a lot less thickness here. Uh, so there's a better performance as far as um, baseline heart maintenance through here. Um, every time that he's in the REM period, we can see that there's a little chaos in the pulse rate. REM is usually when sleep breathing is the worst. We'll see a truer picture of what's going on because everything's paralyzed except for the diaphragm. So I'll just go through really quick and kind of show you some spots where um, we can see what's going on. So here we have a hypopnea, reduced airflow, um, uh, oxygen desaturation. After this hypopnea, we have pulse rate spike, big old side breath. We try to normalize everything. Um, if we look at this pulse rate throughout here, uh, 68 is the low. 73, 72 is kind of mid-range there. Right here, we have 85. So the pulse is responding to this fight or flight response, also responding to the body saying it needs more oxygen. Uh, down here in the pleth, uh, we see a minimization of the blood flow actually going to the periphery of the finger. So this is what insurance says is significant. Hypopnea, uh, reduced airflow there. But we also have instances that it happens that it is not hypopnea or it can't be marked as an apnea because it doesn't meet qualifications. However, here we see if we look at the pleth, it's uh, not normalized. There's a lot of minimization, big side breath here and a pulse rate spike, exactly the same. So um, that's not even a rear, is that right? So it it, it would be if, um, if, uh, if it was in a lab. And uh, so the reason why I say pulse rate matters because anything over, uh, anything four beats per minute and rising is synonymous with an arousal. Um, this is based off of a case study. I think the cohort was like 380 patients. However, that's not recognized as a way to say um, this is a rear. 
in a in a so lab can we, or can we repeat say. this crucial point are you saying three beats so three beats per minute increase in pulse anything beyond mm -hmm. that we can yep. conclude is likely to be significant aka an arousal yes yeah great once you hit over three beats per minute and it keeps rising up uh so for instance like this is where we'll say mid-range about 73 here we do have 78 because there's a small side breath there but Right here, we have 83, right after this big side breath of pulse rate. So that's 10 beats per minute, significant. Um, can this be marked? No. With this in a hospital setting or in a lab setting, would it necessarily be marked as a rear or not everywhere? It all depends on the tech. It all depends on if the um, physician says, well, you know what? RDI doesn't even matter because we can't even prescribe a CPAP off of that. It's got to be AHI. But we do have some good old school doctors say, well, RDI, you know what? Maybe we need to do something about that. It just kind of depends. Uh, so we'll travel a little bit more here again. Uh, pulse rate spike, big side breath. If we look at this pleth wave, it's out of control just because there's so many flow limitations. Um, the heart really is working overtime. And this is that area where we saw the really thick uh, pulse rate on that hypnogram. So if we go through this study, we'll continue to see things like that where um, we're getting pulse rate spikes, big old side breaths, airflow limitations. And this is a true airflow limitation here where we have a dip in the pulse and then a spike right after. Uh, it, typically, this is what we'll see. I got it zoomed out to five minutes, so uh, we can't necessarily see what goes on in between those periods. But uh, this is what I would say truly happens uh, right before you have a big side breath. Pulse rate spike will dip and then it'll spike. Um, as we go through here, we see this breathing is definitely not normalized. Um, we're going into REM sleep here, so it will be very, very funky. Um, the snoring is increasing. Anytime I see snoring like this, um, I would say this is mild, border, and moderate. But probably is open mouth or open teeth breathing, which means the tongue is closer to the back of the airway. Um, so uh, there may be a problem there. There may be some nasal component where the mouth has to open. Here in REM sleep, we almost have an apnea at this point, but we don't. It's not uh, the minimization of the flow is not as great, but so we can't count as anything. There's no desaturation. There's just pulse rate spike right after this flow limitation. This would not be a rear on uh, a sleep study in lab. There would be no arousal associated with this being that there potentially is no uh, uh, cyber. So we keep going through, keep going through, and we see these everywhere. Just kind of spot check them. We see them everywhere that aren't necessarily associated with um Pulse rate spikes. I mean, not associated with apneas or hypotenias. Deep sleep, we typically don't see anything just because the upper air resistance is as strong as it's going to be. Um, so this is an example of a patient who has a low HIRDI. However, they still suffer throughout the night um, with upper air resistance, airflow limitation that gives the same signs and symptoms of sleep apnea. What is their RDI and their HI? Uh, 3.6 on this one. RDI? Yeah, because the HI and RDI will be the same on here, only because I can't mark rear since I don't have arousal. Right. Um, But yes. in all of those events that aren't being marked as apneas and hypopneas, the physiological responses are more or less the same as if it was, let's say, an apnea of 15 seconds. Or is yes. that not fair to say? That's fair to say. It's exactly the same. The only difference might be just the oxygen desat, right? But but that's right. But the sympathetic nervous system response, or the freaking out, and the heart rate increase, yeah. more than likely the EEG arousal. We just don't have mm -hmm. the leads on the head, but it's more or less the same event. Yes. Yep. It's just not being counted. That's right. Fight or flight response is still active, um, and. Here, not everybody uses this PLEF, but here we could definitely see in the PLEF how uh, blood flow oxygenation is being affected. And this is just to the finger. Now, pulse oximetry is, I think, 70% correct or something like this, a low percentage, but it's all we have. So if you think about the way the body works in fight or flight, blood gets shunted to the heart and the lungs. It gets shut off everywhere else. So we're talking about blood flow being shut off to organs. So how does a cancer grow? Cancer grows off of deoxygenated areas because you're gonna start building more blood vessels, more uh, blood vessels around this area to get more oxygen to it. So, uh, you know, 
you really get into trouble. The gut can shut down, gut motility can shut down, which can cause GERD. Um, gut motility shuts down, the acid just starts to build up, and now you get reflux. Um, that's one way that reflux can, can be had at night. Um, and then you think about also constipation can come from that too. So uh, all these things, anything that can happen with the sympathetic nervous system activation happens a lot at night with these instances. Um, do you, but, oh, go ahead. Do you encounter a lot of patients who have RDIs, say, less than 10 or less than 5, but clinically, clinically mm -hmm. they present the exact same as your next patient who might have an AHI of, let's say, 25? Yes, exactly the same. Right. Exactly the same. I'm super tired. I, I hate my life. Like, I can't get it together. I can't really think. It's so cloudy. I, I get really aggravated really easy. Um, and you start having insomnia because the body does not want to go to sleep because it doesn't feel safe. It's like, I'm so tired of the day, but I can't even go to sleep because so now you'll go to sleep later and later because the body doesn't even feel safe enough for you to go to sleep, but you don't have sleep apnea. So what do we do? What about how telling is it when you see it like deep sleep or REM sleep, that's less than usual. Obviously there's a range with the norms. So I think we should try mm -hmm. to strike a balance here and not fear monger people of maybe sure. the lower side, but like, let's say deep sleeps like 2% and REM sleeps like 10%. How, how telling is that? Like, if you see that on a sleep study, how sure are you that the patient is going to have daytime complaints? Do you get some unicorn uh, where they're like, they feel good or they all feel bad? They all feel bad. I, like, I don't even need to look at anything else. If I see, <laughs> um, if if someone says, can you look at this sleep, sleep report for me and tell me what's going on? I go to the hypnogram first because I want to see what the pulse is doing, if it's on there. Um, and then I'll see if there's kind of uh, areas where usually in REM, there's significant events. And then I'll look at the sleep staging. What does deep sleep look like? What does REM sleep look like? And it's like, if those are affected, then there's a problem. Um, one, one misconception that's huge in sleep is you get less sleep as you get older. Well, you do because the tongue never stops growing. So if you don't correct your tongue posture and put it in the right place, then it's just going to make cause you to do this number as you get older and your sleep just gets wrecked and wrecked and wrecked. Yeah, you get less sleep. And it's not because you're getting older. It's because your airway has been kind of not addressed for long in a situation where your body's become used to not sleeping. So um, kids get a whole lot of deep sleep. Growth hormone is, is, is secreted at that time. And as you get older, supposedly it lessens. However, if you see someone that does have a good sound upper airway, um, has really good sleep, um, you will see well into the 30s where you're getting 20% deep sleep. Would you say it's not uncommon for certain pay or let's say patients with RDIs less than five with clinical symptoms when they go on PAP or they get surgery or they treat it with some other treatment modality that they find resolution? Yes. It yes. is common? It's common. Yeah, I thought so too. <laughs> it is. It is, yes. yes. Do you, I've even seen some patients go through the, the most drastic surgeries with RDIs less than five and then they cure themselves. Yes. Yeah, it is. Oh, uh, oh go ahead. I was just going to say, like, it's very clear at this point. I'm, I'm kind of preaching to the choir on this one, but I'm just saying this for the audience. But <laughs> we're obviously not measuring the right things here. Uh, definitely not. Um, we, we need to we need to look at their body's response versus, um, you know, the apneas and hypopneas are for a certain demographic. That demographic does, you know, that. Of course, a patient that has comorbidities and a little bit larger and um, I mean, this breathing is all based on this architecture here, but patients that are bigger and have more comorbidities, they probably dealt with it for so long that they are going to have full blown like RDI 60, you know, something like that um, versus I have a patient in, in Texas, it's a 70 year old lady whose BMI is like 18 and she has a RDI of 99. I mean, this, this is serious. No joke. She's thin as a rail. She's old. But it's this that's causing that. Um, so, you know, the, the metrics that we're using kind of exclude or make us think there's a certain type of patient or person for 
sleep apnea. But truthfully, we got to look at the signs and symptoms because no one would even give her a sleep test. Oh, you're so skinny. Why do you need to see you? You work out. And sleep? Why do you need a sleep test? We'll just give you some Adderall or something. I talked to a patient today. Her age, I was 14, and her insurance declined a CPAP based off of that. And age, so I, crazy. it's so crazy. I couldn't believe it. Like, not even there was no RDI. It was just an at because it was an at home sleep test. Same, same, same thing, right? And yeah. HI 14. Yeah. No, no CPAP for you. I could not. I can't even. I'm at this point where it is hard to process that. I don't know like, what reasoning is going on where you say an eight, f- choking 14 times per hour and having your oxygen desat is normal or something. Like we shouldn't treat it. Yeah. What? It's madness. It's madness. It is. <laughs> <laughs> it is. <laughs> It is. It, it's just, I mean, it, I feel like it's getting worse, but it's, you know, I, and I and I hear this in the community. It's like, well, you know, you got AHI 5, just sleep on your side. All right. All right. All right. Yeah. But I'm still tired. I still got high blood pressure. Yeah. So what, what's that all about? The best is when they say, oh, you have mild sleep apnea. Like, it's just mild. <laughs> <laughs> but it's yeah. like, but, but doctor, I, I mean, my whole life is falling apart. Like I can't like, function. <laughs> but yeah, but it, it's mild. Yeah. So what are you, uh, what are you going on about? <laughs> we probably just need to give you some SSRIs or some kind of mood stabilizer. That'll, yeah, exactly. that'll be Yeah.